Welcome back to Case Studies. I am with who has become a good friend, Diljeet Taylor. And I, I think to kick it off, uh, where I would start is that you inspire me. And there's, you know, it's fun for me to be around people that inspire me. And, and like going into like what is inspiration, I think the reason you inspire me is because you care so deeply about the people that you serve and work with and you change lives. And so anyway, and like, I'll give you an example of when I experienced it. So, um, I took my daughter to this girl dad event that you came up with and it's this BYU event. Um, you've got dads that will bring their daughters and it's specifically focused to young women and how to raise young women and kind of what the psychology that they go through. And, and it was humbling to get the data and actually learn just how important being a dad and being dad specifically with those kids from nine to 13, how it impacts the trajectory of their life. And like, anyway, it, it was uh, a highlight of me and my daughter. When, when I sit down, I talk to Cubby who I, you know, my only sad thing is that I didn't do it with my other daughters, but, but when I do it, when I sit down with Cubby, what she looks for forward to in 2024 is the girl dad event. I love and, that. And so anyway, it was really special. Um, so thank you for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I, again, I'm impressed by just being a part of some of your guys's conferences and just seeing the focus. It really is the same for you as a leader is to just inspire that next generation of, of whoever it is, whether it's entrepreneurial or, you know, just, whatever aspect of, you know, people's life they want to get better at. I feel like you guys have been good role models. And that's why I'm drawn to whenever you're asking me to speak at Yo. something or do something, I'm like, yes, it's Casey Ball. Let's do it. Um, I like how intentional you are about yeah, thank you. your purpose. So like, uh, let's talk about today and then we'll go okay. back to the origin. So today I, I, I was, did a little Google search as I was coming over here just cause I wanted to see like, and this is straight off BYU's website. I mean, you guys have been on a run at yeah. BYU, like like a, a legit run as far as like the success you guys have. I'll read some of these uh, these off. Uh, NCAA Division One National Championship, uh, uh, two thousand twenty twenty one. Um, one individual cross country champion, Whitney Orton, twenty twenty one. BYU did two national runner-up finishes, 19 and 21. Like, this is in the country. This is what? Yeah, it's, we've two, had a good run. I've got great women. But and, I, I would go on and on. BYU uh, top six, t uh, six top 10 finishes, NCAA championships, 16 All-American honors. And, and we could get into, like, the individuals and, like, every one of them has a story. But it kind of goes on and on and on. Um, 24 meets that you guys have just flat out won the entire meet. Some of these statistics, I don't even know. So I'm, I'm just like, yeah, those are good. Those numbers sound really good. So cool. So like go back to like, you have to be proud of that. You have to look <laughs> at like what you guys have done and say like, I'm so proud of what we built. Yes. And then more so, I'm proud of who the women have become through chasing those dreams. Yeah. And that that's the thing that I can take a step back after it's all said and done. And again, sport is, it's this small fraction of their life. And I understand that. And I, I want to have a big imprint on that small fraction of their life so that they can turn around and take this experience and again, go inspire other people. But I, but I think something that's beautiful about sport is it's kind of a microcosm of life. Yeah, absolutely. Like it, it it's is. like, and how you fight and specifically with like cross country. Yeah. It's, it's a battle, it is a battle mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. I think you, you battle all of those facets when you're lining up and just racing. And it really depends on you individually. Yeah. Right. So it's different than team sports where, um, while we do have a team score at the end of it in cross country, but it's your individual effort. And so at the end of the day, you have to be able to rely on yourself in those dark moments. And that's a beautiful life lesson because it prepares them for 
the future of life and yeah. some of those dark moments that are going to happen uh, regardless of, you know, all of the good we try to bring into the world. You're going to have these difficult and hard moments and who they've become through this sport is going to help them navigate those lessons later in life. And so it, I understand I play a really important role in the lives of these women, uh, not so much for the wins we're trying to chase. I'm competitive and obviously yeah. you have to be to be in sport, but um, how it's going to serve them later in life. Yeah. I think 18 years of coaching, it's taught me that it's bigger than sport and it's it's bigger than one win or one season. Yeah. My wife, she was a college athlete. She played at UVU. She played volleyball, Chelsea. And we have the UVU women coming over to our house a week from Monday. And, you know, Sam, the coach, coach yeah. uh, is kind of having us talk to the girls who are playing. And so it's a, it's created this uh, situation where we get to go back and we get to look at like, hey, how did that impact your life? And the list is so long. Like the lessons that she learned, good and bad. Yeah. You know, that there's times where she's starring and she's, she's the starter. And there's somebody times where somebody took her job yeah. and she has to go like act like she's excited, but like really like dig deep to be happy for the team, even though you're not shining, you know, you're not the one in the spotlight and th those lessons. Yeah. And it it's so relatable to life because it's about moments and everyone is going to get their moment. You have to live life that way. And and I, I, it's a hard thing to teach to women because they all are ultra competitive and they come into this program to, you know, be the best. And when they're in the shadows, sometimes it's super hard um, to to ge genuinely be happy for yeah. someone else's success. It's not natural. No, it, it is not natural. It's a very learned behavior. Yeah. And so when women come to me and they're struggling with that aspect of the sport, I validate those feelings. I think it's super important to validate. Like I understand, don't make them feel guilty for feeling that way. But then also teaching them like, it is important to be happy for other people's success. And it really doesn't take anything away from your own. Yeah. And you will get your moment. Um, yeah, I think some people are naturally more abundant. Yeah, it's, it's an abundance I, I, mentality. I think all of us have kind of, you know, some of us are more, all of us are scarce and abundant. Yeah. And some of us are more abundant and some of us are more scarce. And you have to like work to get into the other one. But that one's one that it's, you got to work to be happy. But it's also like, that's how it is in marriage. That's how it is with in business. That's how it is yeah. with your kid. Like th those are skills that go with you forever. Well, and if you can not master them, but get comfortable with the idea of being yeah. happy for someone else, uh, I learned that lesson really early in life. And I'm I'm so grateful that I did. Being um being in a family where my my parents were the first Indian family that, you know, immigrated over to the Central Valley. And when other families would come uh, and they would have just a small taste of success, whether that was finally buying a gas station or getting a business or buying their first home, yeah. we would celebrate that like it was our win, right? And so that fostered this idea inside of me to constantly be happy for other people's success. I, I don't know that you can really teach that, but I organically learned that lesson. It's so beautiful and like you're blessed to have a culture and parents that did that. Cause it's not, you see the opposite more than you see that, like where it's. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of what people noticed in me. When you talk about leadership style, yeah. it's that ability to be happy for other people, to see their wins and recognize them and celebrate them. And I, I think that's why I got into coaching, right? Someone saw that in me. It's like, yeah. Hey, you have this gift and, and let's, let's, you know, put you into this position where you can kind of showcase that gift. And, yeah. and now I'm teaching my women to do the same thing of, Hey, let's, let's be happy. Other people's wins are our wins also. And, but I think, I think everybody from the outside looking in would see you 18 or 20 years into coaching and like, you know, getting paid money to go speak and, you know, having Nike and different groups that would like to have access to you and go back to where it began. Like, like, you know, you go, go even to the origins. You said that your family came from India. 
yeah, my, my parents immigrated here. They, my dad came when he was in high school and then went back to the village and, uh, married my mom. Um, it was an arranged and, marriage. And, and so what does that mean? Like for, for somebody that's not, uh, familiar with Indian culture. Yeah. So arranged marriages, which still happen to this day. And, and now that I have children, I, I can kind of see, you could probably understand a little bit of, you know, the benefit of that. I've got some good friends that are Indian and they talk about it and they're the, like, it's, like pretty natural. Like it's like your mom kind of knows what's good for you. And so she'll go talk to some other moms and they all kind of work together to say, Hey, this would be a really good fit. And so the way he was describing it was less of what, like in my mind, it's like you both show up and you don't know each other and the it families is, don't know each yeah, other. I and, mean, the families know each other. You don't generally know each other, yeah. but you grow up with this idea that my family knows best. Yeah. And I trust the path that they're going to put me on because it's going to be one of success. Yeah. Right. And so they're going going to find a partner for me that is going to fulfill all of my and needs. And it's cultural. It's been around for a long time. Like, yeah, th- since this the beginning. Yeah. yeah. So my mom was 18 and her mother was like, I will send my daughter to America. You just have to promise that you will educate her. She will get an education. And so she came at 18 and by 22 had three kids. Um, it was in nursing school and worked really hard. So my, my work ethic comes yeah. kind of from that. But yeah, they settled in the Central Valley in California and we're really trying to preserve our our culture. Yeah. So it was it was kind of a fear based parenting. If I've, I'm being totally transparent with you, uh, they were worried if they let us, uh, you know, they they were trying to clip our wings because they didn't want us to be too American, but also not too Indian. And so you you know you were growing up. I mean I went to my first day of kindergarten not knowing a word of English. Right. And it's incredible. It's, it's wild because when you ask my grandfather why he left, you know, the riches of the village that we're from in India to come to America and, you know, having a master's education and then coming and working in strawberry fields. Yeah. uh, That takes true, just, just really he had vision for his, his future, for his kids to be able to give them an opportunity. And then of course I go. Because they were prospering in India, right? Very much so. Like it wasn't like they were like leaving a bad situation. No. They They were prospering. But the opportunity that this country provides is so different. And, and that's why, um, that's why he, he came here and got established and gave up some of his own education and wealth to, to try to start, you know, something for his son and daughter. And so my father, uh, it was expected of him, graduate high school, graduate college, get your master's, and then we're going to go back and you're going to have an arranged marriage. And there wasn't really opposition to that. Yeah. Um, because it's just naturally what, you're supposed to do. And so for us growing up, kind of trying to navigate the two cultures and to try to make this culture happy, but also try to be Americanized, it it was really just a battle. And as they tried to keep it in isolation, that's really how you kind of preserve a culture. That's how they raised us is, hey, we're going to really isolate our children. And, And you can't, you can't evolve a culture like that. Yeah. Uh, looking back now, I think I always say, once you know better, you do better. And I think they would have done things a lot differently. But we were still expected as children to have this same upbringing and the same expectation of an arranged marriage. And you don't leave your house until you get married. And um, I kind of forged my own path because I fell in love with running. Yeah. That really was, for me, um, a ticket out. Out. And, uh, and I took it and, you know, it, it's. And were they okay with that? No, I, I, I really went through a period of my time during college that my, my parents actually didn't speak to me. Wow. Well, was that so hard? Because you're like a super strong, independent yeah. woman. So like the, there's a side of it. that's like, I'm just doing it. But it's also like, they're your parents. Yeah. There's a side of you that is just doing it. And freedom was so. Uh, exhilarating for me to have a sense of freedom and to yeah. be able to make my own decisions that you kind of sacrifice that that yeah. other side of it. Um, it and I did. I, I ran for the local university. I was a three-time All-American, got noticed by an Olympic development coach out that was training out in Stanford. And I, I continued to chase that dream after college. Uh, and he he was the guy that that saw the coach in me. When did you know that you were like you were good. Like, was it right off the bat? You just knew that you had the. the In running? Yeah. Like when when was it where you, you, it clicked where you're like, I can be really good. So I beat every boy in fifth grade and in sixth grade. And I didn't know that I could be good, but I 
it built confidence in yeah, me. Yeah, of course. And it it gave me a little bit of an identity. And all of a sudden, I went from being the kid who was just trying to fit in to being the girl who was getting praise for this, you know, speed. So you got a lot of and, love. And yeah, like, and so yeah, all of a sudden, attention. it was like, all right, I'm going to run in high school. And my parents were very supportive of yeah. that. Um, and then junior year in high school, I started getting scholarship offers and that just was when the they opportunity. Got that was when they like. Yeah. And it was, you know, Indian girls don't run in college. Yeah. And I, I just, that line was repeated to me so many times that, um, that I'm proud. I, I can sit here proud at 46 and say, yeah, they actually do. How, how hard, like how, how hard to like, and, and, and again, like being a parent, you just give your parents a lot of grace because you're like, I'm figuring it out as I go well, to, you know, and so. And culturally, right? There's yeah. this different aspect of parenting doesn't come with a manual. Parenting in a foreign country definitely doesn't come with a manual. And so looking back now as a parent myself, I give them a ton of grace and I, I don't have any resentment or bitter yeah. feelings. Matter of fact, I'm so grateful for my path and the way I had to forge it myself because yeah. I wouldn't be sitting here. That's, who you be- that's yeah, how you became you. Who I am. And, yeah. um and when you really are passionate about something, what are you willing to do to, to follow sacrifice. that passion? Yeah, you know, sacrifice. and that's, that's how I know that that sport was my calling. But you knew pretty early, like, I love this. Like, yeah. this is like what I was put on this earth to do was to, to go yeah, like, it's, run at that. It's, it's such a freeing feeling. And I, I don't know how else to describe it other than for that moment in time when I'm just putting one foot in front of the other. I belonged. Yeah. And that sense of belonging gave me um, a lot of confidence. No, it's so cool. So your high school start getting a lot of love. You stayed local. Was staying local, did that have a lot to do with your parents? Staying local was you go to the local university. So you're not allowed at that time girls growing up weren't allowed to leave their home until they get married. Okay. And so moving to a university and living in dorms, th- those those aren't really options. But there was this university, Cal State Stanislaus, about 15 minutes from my parents' house. And uh, How pumped were they? They were just like, let's go. I like these like, yeah, Indian like, cultural <laughs> rules. Let's- <laughs> yeah, no, it was, I, and I just kind of showed up like, hey, I don't know if you remember me, you recruited me, but I I want to try out. And I ended up being a walk-on, right? Come turning on. away you, a scholarship. No, no. So you turned away scholarships. Turned away to, a scholarship, wow. come back a year and a half later and just walk on to this division two program uh, and, and end up qualifying for NCAAs. And you, you, you lit up the... Well, yeah, I earned that scholarship the first year and, and I had an opportunity. There was no transfer portal back then. Right. So you couldn't just bounce around, but there were still ways to be like, Hey, do you want to go division one? Do you want to? And I, I just, I'm loyal. And I thought, Hey, this is the place and the woman that gave me a chance. And I'm, I'm going to see my eligibility through here. So finish college and then talk to me about, cause I remember we were talking the other day or the last time and you were talking about this particular coach. And and there's this one coach that was life changing for you. Yeah, Frank Gagliano. Um, I wasn't the best kid on that Olympic development team, and but he made me feel like I was. So give me some context on what's going on. So there's a Olympic development program. It's the top, yeah. you know, athletes from all over the country trying to make. Like yep. trying to go run in the Olympics. Nike sponsored this team. And every four years, there's Olympic trials that, you know, the top three Americans get move on to to become Olympians. Yeah. But they they take the top 30 in the country and and you just have an opportunity to kind of chase that top And, and Frank's three spot. coaching that team? Or Frank is he... Gagliano is uh, hired by Nike to coach this Nike farm team, which is just a post-collegiate Olympic development team. That had to be and, such, a, such an exciting time. Well, and everyone there is you know, division one athletes, the first day he meets me, he's like, what's your name? Diljeet. What's your name? Diljeet. Say it again. Diljeet. Do you have a nickname? Mm, Not really. I'm gonna call you D2. So like for like the first like six months or eight months of me seeing him at practice, it was D2. Good job today. And, uh, but we developed this relationship and I think he saw the energy or felt the energy that I would bring to practice. And and I showed up every day. You know, I learned that lesson in, in kindergarten. Like Yo. you show up with a smile. You know, whether you're the best kid on the team or the worst kid on the team, you're going to show up with a smile. And I, I, it was it was the energy that I brought. And that's what he gravitated towards. You know, you have 30 athletes out there that are super type A personalities, very serious about their craft. And, you know, um, 
And I, I was there in the same way, but I was also there for the experience and for the opportunity to just chase this dream and see yeah. where it could take me. Do you think it meant more to you because of your culture? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I never took one day for granted out there. You know, I had um, like $3,700 to my name uh, when I moved out to Palo Alto and it, it, I, I was like the richest person in my in my own lens. I, I was the richest person because I was living a life uh, that was designed by me. Oh my gosh. And it was, it was that, that, uh, like that. That gives me chills. Yeah. Just, just, just thinking about like this moment in life of saying, Hey, I can like do what the script tells me to do, or I can chart my own course. And it's gotta be like kind of scary, kind of exciting. Yeah. There's a level of bravery. It's 51% bravery and then 49% just crazy. Yeah. Right. Um, and at no point did I know like, Hey, I'm going to make this work. Failure was not an option. Like there was no chance I was going to come back and say, you know, I made a mistake or this wasn't the right thing. And I made plenty of mistakes from 18 on. Um, but I, I chose that path and there's something to be said when you choose something, you're willing to, you know, find a way to make it work. Own it, make it work. Yeah. So, so you went all in, how did it, how did it pan out? It was great. I mean, I I was successful. I didn't make an Olympic team. That wasn't the point for me to be there. Uh, the point for me to be there was to have this relationship with Coach Gags. So we're there, and he um, it's lo- it's in Palo Alto. Like headquarters are of Nike are in Portland, but he's coaching at Stanford. And if you've been on Stanford campus, you know it's breathtaking. It's, oh, it's amazing. And and my a part of my heart is still in Palo Alto. Yeah, like for um, you to for show that up there. At that point in life, it's got to just have like tattoos on your soul, oh, like just, just like these imprinted. Yeah. And, and so who he was for me at a time in my life where I needed someone to just believe in me, um, that that was, I, I thank him, you know, several times a year still to this day. My success as a coach, as a woman, as a person um, is, is tied back to Frank Gagliano. Uh, so we we had a guy named Jeff Curl come out and speak to us. This is probably six or seven years ago. And he's, you know, really incredible entrepreneur who's the founder of Stance Socks. Oh, yeah. You know, he, he I, did, I've heard him speak. He, talented speaker, but he got up and he was talking about this concept of, he, he's like, when you're, when you're young, you care what your parents think about you. And then you switch, you know, when you're a teenager and you really care what your peers, peers think. Yeah. Think about you. He's like, but there's a point kind of when you're a young professional and he's like, if you have somebody that's not your parents and it's not your peers that believes in you more than you believe in yourself, that person's a gift. And he talked about, you know, Stephen Covey was a guy that at that exact moment saw something in him and it just like gave him this confidence to go run through a wall. And I think about myself and that was Todd Peterson for me, you know, at a young age you know, Todd and Alex Dunn, when them believing in me mattered so much. And I just wanted to like make them proud. You know what I mean? Like I I would not let them down. I was just like, I'd rather like die on the, you know, on the field. And and they see something, you know, for me, Gag saw something in me that no one had ever seen. But the fact that he verbally told me that he saw this potential in me was enough for me to trust him. Yeah. It was enough for me to trust him and take a risk and just completely change course of your life. Yeah. And just like, okay, I'll, I'll try this thing called coaching. And and give me like the, what was the moment where he said you could coach or like, was it? It was after a workout and, and I was, I was, I was the type of athlete that didn't always ask the why, but always wondered the why, like, why are we doing this workout? What does it mean? Um, and so we'd had some conversations like that, but it was, Again, just a moment after practice where I was standing there and he just looks over and says, hey, you ever think about going into coaching? I was like, coaching? No, no. And you're how old? No, I'm 20, like five, 26 years old. It's like, no, 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 gags. Like if I go back and start telling everyone, like I want to go into coaching. Yeah. I had a really good fifth grade teacher. And when I, I was expected to go into medicine originally. That was kind of the cultural the yeah. plan. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah. my aunt, my mom, all yep. of 
Um, but I, I wanted to be a teacher. I, I felt like, oh, if I could just impact someone's life, like my fifth grade teacher did for me, yeah. that would be great. And then you get into college and you go into student teaching. You're like, mm, maybe not fourth or fifth grade. That, that, yeah. that age group Hard is age. not for me. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe going into college and being a professor that, yeah. that was enticing. So when he mentions coaching and it wasn't like, I didn't think it was a career path because I saw my female, my coach in college was a female yeah. and she had had, it was going having a family and, and it was, it was a career, yeah. but it definitely wasn't a career path for me. And to be able to go explain to people like, Hey, I'm going to go be a coach. It's like, Oh, do they pay you for that? Yeah. Is, that is that a volunteer thing? Is that for fun? Yeah. Um, and so it took a while for me to wrap my head around that. But that same time in a three week period, he tells me that and then my old college coach at my university that I ran for calls me and tells me, hey, I'm going into administration. And when I think of the woman I want to take over this program, it's you. So here are these two super important people in my life giving me the same message and seeing something in me. And it helped me become open to it. Like, yeah. okay, she's telling me you can take my job. So already here are this. At a position young age. is there. Young, yes, I'm 26, yeah. 27. So there's this tiny little university next to Palo Alto called Menlo College. It's where all yeah, of the, of it's a private school and there's a position there that's just part-time. It's like a $3,000 stipend and I'm tutoring for kids out at Palo Alto. I'm a nanny for a family. I'm just doing all these random just things. Just to get by. And, yeah. um, and I, I start, you know, just to get my feet wet. I just take this job coaching these Menlo College kids in cross country. And I liked it. I took a bunch of wrestlers and they went from like being the bottom of the conference and simply just by bringing energy to these kids and having some sort of structured training plan and having them kind of believe we finished third in the conference. And I was like, okay. And so Kim Dice, who was uh, my former college coach, had given me a two-year warning, like, hey, I'm going to retire in two years and move up to administration. And so yeah. get something on your resume. Um, and I did that at Menlo College, still lived out in Palo Alto and um, did a bunch of odds and ends, you know, was a personal assistant for a family, did some charity events that yeah. I helped with and um, and then took that job in 2007. Wow. So you took her job. Um how are you feeling? And like, was it, was it supernatural? You could step, cause obviously you'd have, you'd have the credibility. Like you're stepping into a place that no one's going to question that you can do what you were telling them to do. Yeah. And it was a division two. So that was a good progression for me as a young female to, to be coaching men and women at, you know, 28 years old. Yeah. Uh, it was a good place to start. And I, I thought, okay, I'll coach a couple of years. Now I want to have a big family and, and then I'll just probably, you know, do the mom thing. So this is a nice thing to do until then. That was my original plan when I got into coaching and I absolutely fell in love with it. Like I could not imagine my life without, it. without this calling. Yeah. Uh, and when it came to the point where it was like, okay, well, you can do it with two kids, but you most definitely can't do it with three. It was just a lot of travel and yeah. time. Um, and I, we made the decision to to continue to coach. And I've got and my you two met boys. your husband where along the way? Like, where did you guys? We met in college. And when I moved to Palo Alto, he started uh, working for his accounting firm. And we just kind of kept in touch. Um, and he went to my family, I think it was like 2006 and was like, I'm going to ask your daughter to marry me. And how did that get received? Um, they did the wedding. So we had an Indian wedding seven months after that conversation. And it was really done how my parents wanted to do it. And like an Indian, like give yeah, context to Yeah, it's like a four a, day wedding, no, right? Like you're, a, you're like, he grew out his beard, wore a turban, carried a sword on the day of the wedding. Very traditional. How special um, is that? And... Yeah, just a beautiful moment. And for my parents, it was really full circle. I think they understood she loves this sport. Yeah. It's helping her become who? who she is and who she's meant to be. And they they gave us the blessing for I our mean, I think I think about my kids and specifically like my my middle daughter. And she is hardcore cheerleader. And for me, like I have no context to this. I'm like yeah. this like <laughs> You're a cheer and, dad. And and she's at this really unique program that they're like best in the nation in like Utah County. But they're they're legitimately they won the national championship last year out oh, of wow. 
thousands of teams. And they have this hardcore, and as a dad, she's 13 years old, and I'm seeing this confidence, and I'm seeing six yeah. days a week, and I'm seeing who she's becoming from this. And I'm like, like, go, you know, your parents had to have been so proud. Like, even if they didn't like it, they had to have seen how happy you were and just said like, man, she's doing it, you know? Yeah. And deep down now, you know, much later in life, decades later, they can look back and I I, I feel that sense of pride. I, I actually threw a Diwali party a couple months ago and my parents and family and my 94 year old grandpa flew in. And as we were sitting by the fireplace the night before the party, um, he said, I never believed you could have come this far. And for me, that was, that was his way of saying, we're so proud of you. And that was enough. That's enough. And I, I, I think that when you become a parent, you have the opportunity to rewrite your own childhood yeah. just through your parenting. And so there were hard things growing up. And I feel like I've been able to rewrite those through becoming a mom and having my boys. And, and also, um, when you grow through hard things and you look back on them, they become insignificant. Yep. And then that's how I feel about the hard things in my journey. They're really insignificant because who I've become and what I've been able to accomplish and who I'm now able to inspire yep. because of that journey, that's the significance in my life. Yeah, I think that, and I don't know why it has taken me this long in life to realize, and honestly, like Tony Robbins is like, yeah. he's my favorite ever, but he has this philosophy that like life is happening for you. It's not happening to you. And that even the problems and the pain, if you can see those as a gift. That it's it will hard shape. in the moment, yeah, right? But, but, it's hard in the moment. But it's amazing how like if you can reframe those the mindset, things yeah. as this, this had to happen for and me really to be just, the person. It's less about the cards that I was dealt and more about like how, how I respond? figured out how to play yeah. them. Right. And, um, and also the emotional muscle that you gain from very much going so. through those hard things. It's like, I think that's the thing that's scary. Uh, again, going to different coaches, Jim Harbaugh just wins a national championship and he came and spoke to us. It was about a decade ago. It was when he was at San Francisco and I got to fly with him back to San Francisco. So it was me and him on a plane and he's talking about this concept. It's his philosophy of we want field corn and not house plants. Yeah. And he talked about how a house plant, you need the perfect sunshine and yep. you need like the perfect amount of water. Field corn, it like finds a little crack in the concrete and, and gets root yep. and finds a way to survive. And he's like, that's what we're looking for is field corn. We don't want house plants. We don't want everything to have to be perfect. It's adversity. It's adversity. It's adversity. Yeah. And it's it's who you become through that adversity. But also it's the ability to have this empathy now. So my lens looks so different because of what I've of went through. And so I have this empathy when I'm looking at other people's hardships and it's it's perspective for me. Yeah, it's amazing. So so you're at the D2 school. How'd it go? It was great. We had a ton of success. And I was at the point of my career um, where I was starting to get reached out by, you know, a the bunch schools. of D1s, right? Yeah. And and I knew I was really content. I had no plans to leave California or even where I was at. It was a good uh, balance. I, I, I would say I could look back at my life and, and I don't really feel like balance exists anymore. Everything in my life now is a compromise of some sort. Of course. But there was balance in in that small D2, I, yep. I was able to find it. And um, yeah, but I wanted to know how, what was possible how, what, what you, where at you the highest take level. It. Yeah, where you, know? you could take it. And, and really test myself and challenge myself. And uh, I had no idea that would be Brigham Young University, um, but they were one of the universities that had reached out to me amongst a few others. And my in-laws live in Lehigh. They were American Fork high school sweethearts that had moved back to Utah. And I just thought, you know, let me just go out for a couple of days and visit my so, in-laws. So your, your husband's roots are what tie you to Utah. Like my you, husband's you, parents' you, roots. His, yeah, his, his parents. Yeah, his, so you didn't have any like 
ties Jimmer. outside of yeah. Jimmer's my tie because I was a big basketball junkie, course, and so yeah. I knew who Jimmer was. Yeah. And I still need to thank him because I'm like, you're the guy that kind of gave BYU an identity for me. Um, but yes, my in laws, we um, you know would watch BYU football. Yeah, and. My father-in-law went to BYU, and that was about the extent of yeah. knowledge I had of the campus. We were coming to Utah a couple times a year. And who who's reaching out? Is this Tom? Uh, Ed Is- Stone? No, Ed Stone, who I had seen. We coached actually against each other at the 2016 Olympic trials. Wow. And I had seen him at a couple track meets. We happened to be at um, a hotel together in Seattle. He sat next to me in the lobby for breakfast. And I joked with him like, oh, how are things in Happy Valley? He was like, whoa, what do you know how about you Happy know, Valley, you know right? Happy and Valley. so we made that connection. And that was years before he sent me an email um, in the summer of 2016. We have this opening for our women's job. We'd like to see if you'd be interested. And I really thought, no, not interested. Yeah. But well, I'm going to go visit my in-laws and and just check it out. Of course. Um, it's a good thing to go through those motions to kind of see what you want, what you don't want. Yeah. As I was kind of entering that idea of going to a Division One school, I thought, okay, the more you go and interview out, the better practice you get. And it was me stepping foot on campus and feeling a connection to the women I had yet to meet. Yeah. It was really that. The you idea. feel guided? Did you feel like there was like something bigger than? Yeah. And it sounds like, was super. Was it a spiritual well, thing? Was it, was it, a, a, it was spiritual and it sounds so cliche, which is why I don't really talk about it a ton, but there was definitely a draw of you need to be here. Yeah. And this place needs you. Uh, well, not the place, actually. It was more the women. Yeah. Um, and I, I could feel a connection to these women, maybe slightly culturally, or just there was something there that I felt like I could relate yeah. to their upbringing. And I I just, I did it for them. And I had yet to meet one of them. It was just, you you felt it. like Yeah, halfway through the interview process, it kind of became a recruiting day for them. And yeah. I, I felt pretty confident that I was going to get the offer. And yeah. I, I was so sure that this is where we needed they to be. They were working. They, they were like, yeah, I called my husband on the way to the airport and I was like, we're moving to Provo. He was like, what? Are you joking? Did they offer you the job? And I was you like, just knew. no, but they're going to. I, I was really confident yeah. that one, they were going to offer me the job. And two, this was somewhere I needed to be. And yeah. It was a leap of faith for sure um, to move my family. I, I always said I wanted to raise my kids somewhere really diverse because when I grew up, I was the only Indian kid in the entire elementary school. Yeah. And I, I just didn't want them to go through that same experience. Yeah. Um, but we're the diversity. We're bringing it, right? No, and so, so it, it's always been fascinating. I've talked to you about this, but BYU is a unique animal. Like yeah. it, it, it's a church school. You know, there's an honor code. You, you culturally, there's the extremes over here that are really weird. You know, and it, it, like yeah. the, it just it, it comes with like uniqueness to it. And coming in with like a fresh lens and even like coming in from an Indian background, yeah. Southern California, like, was it a fit always or was it like, oh, was I, it- I don't know if I would use the word fit. Um, I, I, it's become a fit for me now because I've found my place yeah. inside it. Uh, I didn't really know some of those things. Those norms culturally. those cultural. Yeah, yeah, because I wasn't that familiar um, with the campus yeah. and and the campus lifestyle and the campus culture and the return missionaries and, all, you know, just yeah. 98.8% of, um, of student population being members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. But I'm I'm glad I didn't think about those things. Yeah. What I thought about instead was the feeling that I have of, hey, this is a place I I need to be. And anytime you get that feeling, it, it is you gotta follow spiritually your heart. guided. Yeah, for of sure. course. Um, and so yeah, it really was a leap of faith. I mean, I took a pay cut to come to BYU. Uh, and the, it seems like the story of my life, right? Like you're like, okay, well, we're just gonna see what happens just trust with this him. opportunity. And uh, but it feels like you've always like followed your heart. Like, yeah. And that's like follow the heart, listen to the instinct. And then again, 51% bravery and 49% crazy. Because when I took this job, yo. the reaction that I got from my colleagues, um, D1, D2 was just like, what are you doing? Right? BYU, really? That's the landing place. <laughs> and um and 
with what I've been able to do, what we've been able to do with the program, those colleagues now understand the why. I mean, you've set the world on fire. I no, mean, it's you, been you, great. Like, it's, it's been, honestly, you make all of us proud. I'm not oh, a BYU you. guy. Like I dropped out of college. And so like, but I'm a fan. Well, you're still a BYU guy. Yeah. I, I, I am a BYU guy, but it's more like you got a Chad Lewis that – yeah. Is raising money, and I want to support Chad. Or it's Coach yeah. Pope that says we are need this. We or, need NIL, and so yeah. you're supporting. So I've become a BYU guy, but I think you look at you know, and women's sports dominate at BYU. They yeah. have a culture of amazing. We women's get great sports. women. We get great women who are disciplined, who are passionate about their craft, and and really women's sports across the country. Right. It's a movement right now. Yeah. There is more investment going in there. Uh, you know, you're seeing more coverage from the media. And and I love that. That's this partnership with Nike is is really intentional about continuing to advocate for women. girls in sport and women in sport until that movement becomes a standard. The yeah. goal is that it's no longer a movement because it's just the standard. Yeah. And um, I'm excited to be a part of that and to do it at BYU, I've been able to, you know, yes, bring the BYU women back to being nationally relevant. That was the original goal is let me just see if I can get these women to be nationally relevant. Because the, they, they've had cycles, right? There's, there's been points where the yeah. program was really great. Early 90s and I mean, late 90s and early 2000s, they, they were kind of on the top and then went through about 15 years where it was some years making it to the NCAA championships and, and, being okay, I, yeah. I would looking at it now, um, and so yeah, that that challenge was let's see if we can go back to just being nationally relevant. And the idea of being nationally dominant wasn't really in the cards until we found ourselves there. So, if you would ask me when I was twenty nineteen years old, what I'm going to do when I get older, I wanted to be a coach. Oh, I like I, I had, you know, my high school coach was so influential in my life. I went and played junior college before my mission and had a really great coach. And so there was, you know, I had like this, you know, it's a 19 year old brain. I don't know what I'm thinking, but I'm like, I want to make a lot of money and I want to coach. <laughs> those two things maybe <laughs> don't necessarily go hand in hand. And so it was like, it was one yeah. of those where, you know, you, you choose your road and you take it, but I've always one love sports and two love great coaches. And, and there was a point in my career where my job was very similar to a coach where you were recruiting a lot. And so I studied, like I, I took a year and studied every coach that I could study. And I'm fascinated to see you're coming in year one to BYU. Yeah. You've got, you've got a culture that hasn't been excellent or hasn't sustained a level of performance. That's like the top of the country. What's meeting one, What's first semester? How do you establish a standard and a culture of like, this is what what we tolerate. This yeah. is who well, we're going to be. First, let me talk about you're in position of leadership. And I think leaders are coaches and coaches are leaders, right? Yeah. So like you, you essentially are a coach. But I think the reason I admire coaches so much is... It's one thing like if you're a boss and yeah. you, you have formal authority, like you can hire and fire and that there's the college, specifically college coaches. It's just different. Like a great coach, they change lives. Like, it, like you know what yeah, I mean? It, it's, it's, a, it's about the... It's, well, you think about 18 and you think about 23. And I always talk about like two super crucial age periods. One is eight to 13, yeah. especially in girls. Right. And then it's 18 to 23. Those windows are just and those are those. Pivotal. And so to be an influential person in someone's life during that window, you don't take that lightly. Um, no, it's, and, a and, it's a stewardship. It's, yeah, it a, is. it's a sacred trust. And you know? it, it's being intentional. When I came to BYU, I was very intentional. I'd already been coaching for nine years. And so I felt pretty confident in the X's and O's. Yeah. We had a ton of success with athletes who didn't have necessarily the same level of talent. And yeah. it was that adversity, that kind of chip on the shoulder, you know, blue collar kid that was just fighting. And yeah. um, I wanted to bring that same mentality here. I wanted to bring that same kind of D2 mentality. Yeah, 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 just, yeah. you know, fighting for it. But, uh, but, but like then, from the outside looking in, I'm like immigrant ancestry, yeah. 
D2, like, I love that, like, scrappiness. Yeah, you know what underdog. I mean? It's underdog. the underdog yeah, mentality. And we never want to lose that, right? Yeah. Like, you, I think Kobe was the one that said it. Like, practice like you're, you know, an underdog and then perform like you're better than everyone. Like, with that confidence. But, um, yeah, just really intentional about wanting to build it the right way. And there's a right way to coach women. And being in an industry where it's really male-dominated still to this day, uh, I knew I had an opportunity if we did this the right way, it would be so inspiring for other programs around the country and to try to be the marquee program that people look at and like, look, she did do it the right way by building these women, believing in them, investing in their dreams, and then turning around and helping them realize that their performances are going to be inspiring for other women. So creating that BYU run for her. For us, that was our why. Our why is run for that little girl that fell in love with the sport. And I I, I think of myself at 10, Casey, and I, I'm so like, pr- I will do anything for that little girl sitting in fifth grade. Like I am, um, I'm willing to do a lot for her to make her proud. Yo. And you think about that for yourself, right? At 10, 12, 14. Um, so teaching these women to remember her, to run for that little girl. Well, and I think that there's even a step beyond that, which is all of us are still that person. You know what I mean? Like if you like- At our core. All of us still have those same insecurities, all of those, you know, those fears. And I think it's like, that's the stuff that- Staying connected to that part of you uh, is is really important. And that was, that was really it. Be intentional about how you're going to build this. Know your why. Create this- team culture that isn't just the word that's thrown around, but actually has substance behind it. And Yo. for us, it's that faith, trust, love built on gratitude. And I'm a big believer in gratitude. I preach that to where after five years of listening to me, the women will leave the program with a, an immense amount of gratitude. Which I don't know if there's like a more beautiful trait to oh, carry it, through life. And it, and an energy to show up with, you know. Yeah, it changes your lens and everything you do. When you have that lens of gratitude, um, you just, you know, they say gratitude and entitlement, those can't coexist. And Yo. so I think it's really important to to teach it and preach it, but also live it. And, Yo. you know, so my drive every day on my way to work is is me practicing moments of gratitude of the Yo. things that I'm grateful for. And sometimes it's, um, it, it's often, it's often, experiences and moments that I get. Those are the things that I'm really grateful for. It's no longer the things. When you're young and you're chasing success, sometimes it is about the things, right? It's the big thing, yeah. Yeah, but but it's these moments and these experiences and these relationships. I, I think coaching is about relationships. And when you can build a relationship with an athlete, um, they, they'll want to run through a brick wall for Yo. you. And, and I have the athletes who I want to coach through a brick wall for. That's the type of women that I have in my program. And you have to have the right women, right? I think that's the beauty of where I'm at. I have the right women at the right place led by the right people. Yeah. And, and I'm very, very connected to, to all three of those things. I love our leadership at BYU. I, I love BYU. I've, I've, um, I've seen the beauty inside it and I, I'm very excited to be there. And then just, um, my women, um, I have an opportunity to see inside their souls and to invest in their dreams and make their dreams actually mine. But how do you do that? So I think there's a difference. It's just the posture of my heart. Yeah. Right. I think that in order for you to really believe and because care. Because I've seen, I've seen it. I've experienced it. Like yeah. with, with my daughter, you know, we came and we watched you speak and you've got these like incredible believe journals sponsored yeah. from Nike. They're so cool. But you're going through them and you're talking about their their dreams and their goals. And I've got a, you know, eight-year-old daughter at the time that's Love writing it. her goals and her dreams. Talk to me about how you do that with an 18-year-old, 19-year-old. Tw- like, how are you helping them find their why? Yeah. And, and the first sheet that I give them in August when they come to cross-country camp is uh, – it's got a question on there and it talks about their goals and, you know, things that they like to see from their coach and their strengths and weaknesses. But but the most important question on that page is tell me about your dreams. And I, I think from day one, I I learn what they what they write and I kind of embody those same dreams myself. Um and it's it's important to ask that question. And I think it goes, it's overlooked oftentimes, right? People don't really 
ask, like, what are your dreams? And no one had asked me. It was in fifth grade, Mrs. Sparks, that she gave us an assignment. And one of the questions was, tell me about your dreams. And I filled it out exactly like I was supposed to. You know, I'm going to college. I'm going to study medicine. And she pulled me aside and was like, oh, well, I'm asking about your dreams. And I had never even thought about, thought that. about what yeah. that was. I didn't understand the question. And so from that moment on, dreams have been really important to me, investing in them, knowing what they are. Um, and and I'm, I'm married to the dreams of my athletes and Yo. I make them my own. I think um, it's why I, I encourage girls at a young age to start dreaming and write about the things they're passionate about. What are the things that bring you joy? Let's put that on paper. Um, and, and it's not really even achieving the dreams that builds the confidence. It's chasing the dream. Yo. And so for me, it's important to teach these women how to chase how a to dream. How to do that. Because it's a skill. Like It I, is. It, it was, I think, five or six years ago. And I've always loved this stuff. Like, it, you know, you've got all these different teachers that teach it different ways. But they're talking about principles. But I remember going to this Tony Robbins event. And there was a guided meditation. And I've done it every day for five years, but it's very sequential. And the start of it is getting deep into gratitude and not just thinking about, Hey, what am I, but like breathing into it and actually going there, like fit, like visualize, like going into the moment, the sights, the sounds, yeah, the smells. Yeah. And I find my, at the front, when I started doing it, it was these hero moments. It's I'm playing sports and I yeah. win the game or I'm a bit, and, and now it's like putting my kids to bed and it's these little small, simple moments, but that, that's the first one. But then it's also going through and it's thinking about people and just kind of sending love their way, just kind of a prayer of, yeah. you know, how can I. Yeah, just being intentional about loving people. But then the last one is getting crystal clear on outcomes. Yeah. And not thinking about them, but actually like living them as if they've actually experienced and celebrating them. And I've seen miracles in my life. I've seen my net worth explode. Yeah. I've seen my relationship with my spouse, like with Chelsea, get so much better. And my kids, because I'm intentional. Yeah. And because I'm dreaming and because well, and I'm you're asking, manifesting, right? We call it just yeah. like manifest what you see for yourself. And uh, I, I think also with gratitude, making sure that it's tied to humanity and, and being in touch with what's going on in other people's lives and an empathy and being of service yeah. to other people that maybe are going through something hard. There's so many blessings that come our way from that. My, my job is one of service, right? I feel like I have a, no, it's gotta be why it's so fulfilling. It's, it's it cause is. you're serving and people all the, time, all the time, all the time. And so when people ask me like, how, how have you become so empowered, right? You're such a strong, confident woman. Were you born with it? Like what, when did you become this confident woman? And I think to myself, I have spent the last 18 years empowering women. What that has done in return for me has helped me become a very empowered woman. You do it for yourself too. It's it's kind of this like it's a boomerang effect. Yeah, it's not like pouring out the glass and there's less in the glass. It's like it it it's, it's this miracle yeah. of like you get filled by serving as much as the person that you're serving. It's, it's yeah, like, and and celebrating wins when you've invested in someone's dream. Oh my gosh, you're celebrating that win like it's your own. And and people always joke about seeing me at the finish line. My celebrations are are heard and seen and felt. Um, but it's if you understood the investment course. behind that win, you would understand the celebration. I'm trying to think of like anything more pure than like that. It's moment. raw emotion yeah. at its finest. Um, and, and I love that I get to experience that. And on the flip side there, you know, there's the victories that you're celebrating, but there's also the losses that you're, that, hurt that you're so mourning a bad. little bit yeah, and, and you're so doing bad. it with them. If you've invested in a dream properly, then you're, you're feeling that loss yeah. just as much. Um, and so the highs are high and the lows are low and I'm not even keel. That's not my coaching style. Yeah. I ride, I ride the highs with them and I sit in the lows with them. And that's what makes us um, so beautiful. 
this is going to be like an impossible question because you have so many amazing women. But talk to me about some of the women that have inspired you the most. Like you could go through all the stories, but like who are the ones that you look at it and you say, this person changed me like way more than I changed them. Like this, like who, who were the ones that you look back? There are so, Casey, there's so many the kids. Um, I'm recruiting. It's my third year of coaching or fourth, second year, second year of coaching. I'm recruiting a kid actually as an LDS kid. Um, and there's, he brings a friend on his recruiting trip. He's a really good miler, this kid, Eric. And uh, there's this kid sitting there. And um, at some point of the recruiting trip, I just wanted to know, like, who is this kid? And so um, I'm like, what's your name? And and what are you doing here? It's like, oh, my name's Terrence. And I, uh, I, I live with Eric. Eric's family has brought me in. I think, okay, well, what are you going to do? for college. Where are you going to go? And not, not going to go to college. Well, why not? Why aren't you going to go to college? I'm recruiting this really good miler right here, but the conversation has shifted to this kid, Terrence Ellis. And, uh, he kind of shared a little bit of his story. Um, wasn't really a good runner, but had started running tracks just because his friend, Eric, that he's living with their family is running track and come to find out he's, you know, just had a terrible upbringing, was living on the streets for a couple of years. And so I finally convinced him, hey, we've got this program where we can try to help kids get into college. Just get me your transcripts and I can put you on the track team here. Um, And when I saw his transcripts, there was, you know, two years where he wasn't really even going to school. And he's telling me that he's living behind a church building with his younger brother because his mom was just struggling with drug addiction. His dad, he had never really seen his dad. Um, And I just felt this pull, like you got to get this kid into school. And he was in the foster system, in and out of the foster system. Um, And, you know, we had a special program, the Promise Scholars Program at Cal State Stanislaus, where I was able to get him into school. He wasn't able to run that first year. Uh, NCAA has all these rules and requirements, but we got him into college through this, you know, kind of backdoor system. And uh, he ends up being my first All-American in the 800. You know, um, just amazing story. A, a kid who would have been on the streets is, is an, is an All-American and gets a college degree. Uh, that changed the trajectory of his life. But what that did for me, and, you know, this was back when you couldn't really help athletes as coaches. There was yeah. no... Um, NIL, there wasn't, you know, and my husband and I would, we'd go grocery shopping and we'd buy like these extra couple bags of groceries and leave them on the sidewalk. And he yeah, it's like ride. you'd, you'd like get he would, kicked out of college for Well, it. yeah, like, it was, like he would was, ride his bike over and pick up these couple bags and we'd try to find odds and ends for him to do. I mean, my just connecting him with people that could kind of help. help him. In him graduating college, not being the All American, I mean that was a great story because the kid had not run really fast in high school, but the sport saved his life. And in you know he's a dad now, and looking back at that, just having the opportunity to be a maternal figure in his life, and just believing in him, and yeah, that that one sticks out is something that uh, we threw a graduation party for him at our house when he graduated college because you know, five years before I never would have thought he would have made it to that point. How did you know? Well, was it just calling to you? Like, did you just like feel like, Hey, I need to. He just, I'm recruiting this kid who, who ends up going on a mission and doesn't come back and run for me. Right. That, that, but because of him, because of Eric, Terrence came into my life and it was a, conversation piece of let me just ask this kid what he's doing because he looked a little lost and yeah um yeah that that story right there it's not even about coaching it's just about helping shift opportunity in someone's life and providing um a path and you know it yeah that's those are the rewarding moments talking about sarah is it musselman yeah sarah musselman 
it was my first year and recruiting um, in the state of Utah, just trying to get the best kids. Someone had given her name to me. And I went on that recruiting visit. Um, and I, I was expecting to walk into a house just like all of the other recruiting visits that I had done for others. And I, I even, couldn't even find her house because it was this tiny little apartment behind some buildings. And uh, when I knocked on the door, it, it her dad let me in and it was it was just her and her dad living in this really small apartment and learning her story, sitting there and just listening to her dad talk about all the things that he had tried to do for Sarah to help her with running. And again, running was the thing that was going to save her. her. Um, and it was that same feeling. She didn't have the grades to come to BYU, um, but it was that same feeling that I had. Like, I got to find a way to get this kid in. But when I left that recruiting visit, her dad... Uh, grabbed my hand when I grabbed the doorknob and was just like, I've done everything I can with her. Please help her. Uh, and how do you not take her at that point? Um, her mom had committed suicide at 14. This dad was trying to navigate raising a 14-year-old girl. Luckily, she found the sport of running. And again, for her, it was this freeing feeling of just putting one foot in front of the other. Uh, she ends up being an All-American for me at BYU, helps us win a national championship. And that's not why I brought her to BYU. That was never the intention. The intention was to give this girl a chance at life. And um, her story is is so powerful. Um, again, just um, who she became. She just has become a mom. And uh, navigating college without a mom I, you know, I so just hard. think that at yeah. 14, when you're just trying to figure out who you are and what your identity is going to be, um, to go through a loss like that to suicide, um, which again is just so unexplainable to, you know, a 14 year old kid and bringing her into a program where the women just embraced her and they loved her and we built her up and she ended up exceeding my expectations of who she could become as a person. And I, I, yeah, those, those are the, those are the stories you get as a coach. You can't write those. Like it's, it's, it's forget the wins. I, I don't, at the end of this whole thing, I hope people don't remember me for wins and losses. I hope people remember me for those moments, for what I'm helping women become and how I'm inspiring other people. That for me is what it's about. But you say women, but it's so much bigger than women because I'm a dad, you know, and, yeah, I'm, a, not, and I'm a man. But when I go in and I listen to you speak, you're speaking about changing lives and you're, you're speaking about believing in someone more than they believe in themselves. And then like going on the journey with them not sending them off on the journey, but actually like being there with them in the crossroads when it's the hardest. And I think that's the beauty, you know, from an outsider looking in, I think that's why you're a special talent. Like that, that, that's, that's why I think you have the success that you have is one, the passion and the like beautiful energy that you bring to every day. But then the second is you just, whether it's natural or learned, you have an ability to see the one and to help them see themselves. And I just think, I, I can't think of anything that when you're on your deathbed, that would mean more to you than that. It's like, you gotta be so satisfied. I think there's a bigger, there's someone giving me help, right? Like I'm definitely guided by God to, yeah. to feel inspired, to want to help um, certain individuals. And, and that's, it's so much bigger than coaching. It's hard to explain. When people ask me to come talk about X's and O's, um, and they're missing the point. It's like, guys, it's not the workouts, right? It's it's the heart. That's that's really the powerful part of this program is a heart that I will always put into it. When I don't feel like I can show up 
with that, you know, with the posture of my heart having the greatest down. intentions, yeah. then I got to find out what the next thing is for me. Yeah. And and I'm not scared of that day. I, I, I really don't think that day will come because I do feel like this is my calling yeah. in life. And when people, it almost offends me when people ask me what's next, you know, and I, I think it's a compliment from them when they're asking me like, what else do you want to do? It's like, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed yeah. to be doing. And it's been the most rewarding rewarding path that I could have ever chosen. It's been fulfilling. I've I've learned more about myself and I'm really really proud that I have taken these leaps of faith. Yeah. And it was against sometimes all odds to get myself to be in this position. But when I look at where I'm at right now and the opportunities I have and the partnerships I've created and the ability I have and the value I feel at BYU, it's, I'm exactly where I need to be. There is no next step. It feels like the biggest impact on the world are in the next chapters of the book. Like it feels like you've prepped your whole life to go make, to that it just feels like there's something big and that doesn't discount today because every one of those individuals and what you're doing, but it feels like. And it may be right. The part of the story that I, um, is, is let me focus on the chapter I'm on right course. now. And, uh, I'm not done with that chapter. Yeah. Matter of fact, I have women in my program right now, um, that are counting on me course to be my best self but also to help them become their best and self. it's not that it, it's not this it's that you're better at this today than you were two years ago Absolutely. and you're better than you were eight years ago and like yeah the opportunity to do it better well, and to and, impact and more and to get better like we win a national championship and i don't think oh i have it all figured out yeah. i think okay how do i get better from this but then i but like i'm, I'm just talking about what i experienced which is it's a platform yeah. that's bigger than these 10 or 15 athletes. It's, it's. And that's what I th need th to figure th out. Th th there, there was yeah. thousands of us. Yeah. At and these that for that me had a life changing experience. That's one of the best weekends of my year. Every single year. Yeah. We've done it three years in a row. And which if anybody hasn't done that, like it, it highlight of, you know, it's something that me and my daughter, talk about weekly, which sounds crazy. She has her believe journal Love that, and we set goals in it. And I've got this little, you know, Polaroid picture that oh, she sees that's in my office. That's me and her. And, and I'm deliberate and I'm conscientious. I think what I got from that, what I got from that, that was so impactful was I've got a couple of years yeah. And I need to like make them count. And she Maximize. needs to know that I believe in her and she needs to know that I'm here for her and that I'll always have her back and that she can do anything that she wants. to. And I try to like articulate that in a more deliberate fashion because of that weekend. And so I think that if I experienced it and I'm one of a lot of people that were there, there's just some, there's a ripple effect that's bigger that, yeah. you're, that you're doing. And I, and I feel strongly about taking that impact and broadening it, yeah. right? Like how do we get what we're doing here on this scale? It, and It has to happen. And, like it, and it's, grow it's, that. It's, it's like because change the world type stuff. I am passionate about empowering these young girls to believe in their dreams, but I'm also passionate about educating dads so that they understand when I even dove into the research, it, it's baffling to even understand how that happens and how 30% just, you lose, 30% of your confidence is just lost in that five years. And if you can have that cross-gender relationship with your dad, which is so crucial in those confidence-building years, to be the guy that says, what are you passionate about? Yeah. Let's write that down. Take that risk. Yeah. Right. And uh, to be able to educate a group of men about their role in those really important years of their daughter's life and to understand the relational aspect of that. Yeah. 
yeah, it's it's a very empowering weekend. And I, I feel grateful that I get to do it at BYU. Again, I wish not I wish there were more than a thousand people that could experience it because I do feel like it's magical. It's, it's special. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about faith. I, I think it's very unique. BYU is predominantly LDS. Um, but you've been a person of faith your whole life. Like, you know what I mean? So it's not like a religious thing. It's like a, I think you would say, you, 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 you said it earlier, like God, g- there's something bigger at work in my life. Like I felt guided so many times in my life and the path that I'm on, I know it's the right path. So talk, talk to me about one, how faith inspires or kind of helps in decision-making and then also just how you think about it. So for me, faith is a, it's a kind of a, all-encompassing, foundational, very spiritual journey. And so it's less orthodox and more about this relationship that I've been able to develop with God. And I, I think in times where I wasn't sure who I had, it was these simple conversations that would just start. And I, I talk to God a lot. Uh, and, and And it really is, there are prayers, but it's mostly a conversation. And, yeah. and my goal kind of, and I, I tell my women this all the time, my goal is to make God laugh every day, you know, and just like the way that I'm talking about my life. And, um, but it's a relationship it's, for it's you. It's not right? a one-sided it's a, relationship it's a, either. It's a friendship. It's a, it's a reverent friendship. But does God talk to you? Like, do you have times where it's like a conversation where it's like, do this or, hey, take it easy or like, do you feel like you? It's less of a discussion and more of a feeling that I feel his presence in my life. And and maybe that's one of the reasons why I, I feel it more being here in this community yeah. than I've ever felt it before. And so there is there is this fear of ever leaving that because I feel so closely connected yeah. to him. And uh, having that, having that sense of wanting to make him proud, is is important to me. And so, what do I do for that relationship? It's it's the conversations, it's the questions that often go unanswered, but later on, I'll get a feeling where I do have answers. Yeah, and it's not something I necessarily you're kind of one of the first people aside from um, a couple of very close people in my circle that has really asked that question about faith. I, I feel like I am a very strong woman of faith. I'm yeah. guided by it and uh, it doesn't scare me. I come from a, a family of faith, very, very faithful. Uh, I grew up Sikh. Cause, yeah. So when you talk about um, India, the amount of religions and sects, it's, it's, there's so many. There are. And where we are from in Northern India and Punjab, it, it's predominantly Sikh, which um, is, you know, 500 and something years old. And, and there's one God. And that's the, the religion preaches whatever faith someone is, help them be better at that faith. Oh my gosh. So if someone is a Muslim, help them be a good Muslim. If someone is Christian, help them be a good Christian. And that's the foundation of how I grew up. But that's my religion right there. And that's that's beautiful. And so I grew up. And so when people ask me, how can you be at BYU? Well, that's how. It's completely in line with the way you see the world. And And, and we believe in one God and we all share the same God. And how we go about how we go about praying or believing or whatever rituals. Um, I respect religion. I respect religion. I embrace spirituality, but I respect religion, and that Yo. comes from how I was born and the home I was raised in. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so special to me. I, th- I think about you know my journey and my interactions with God. And it, 
you know, I think about the way most time it's not a convert, but there's been times where it's been a conversation. Yeah, no, mine are conversations. Most definitely a conversation. Yeah. And I feel really good with where that relationship has evolved yeah, it's, to. It's, it's like, I don't know, your, your, your story fires me up. I love you, it. You, you bring a truly beautiful energy to any room that you show up in. And I think about the impact that not only you've made on BYU and the, 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 you know, cross country, but also like you, you make an in, impact on the community and it, the ripples are moving. And so it's just, I've, I've looked, you know, I've looked forward to this podcast because I think you have a beautiful story and I think it needs to be told more. And, and we've, we had you come out to one of our summits and we had a lot of people come out and phenomenal speakers with great messages. And I walked away saying my favorite person that spoke was Dilji. And we just have to invite her every time oh, because she fires it. me up. Yeah. So. Well, because of you guys, I've actually been asked to speak at some other summits and um, it's I'm like, really, you guys want in that industry, you want a cross country coach to come talk about um, these I, principles, I, but I, I think your I think I think your story needs to be told a lot. Oh, and I and I think the more that you tell it, the more good that happens in the world. And I think it's because it comes from a foundation. Uh, it's the stuff that we've talked about. It comes from a foundation of gratitude. It comes from a foundation of believing in people and empowering people to believe in themselves. It comes from a foundation of making a dent in the world and going and like helping, you know, you can't go run the race for no. the, the girls that you coach, but you can help them get in the right mind space and the right emotional space and the confidence to go run that race that only they can run, but run it better. When my job is always like, put the women on the line, believing in themselves. If I've done that, I've done my job. Uh, I, I used to be really private about my story. And you guys were one of the first people that asked me to get on stage, minus coaching, yeah. uh, you know, and, and that was the first time I really shared my story, which wasn't that long ago, Casey. Yeah. Uh, and the more I've shared it, the more, you know, vulnerable I've become with it. It's become powerful no, even to the, myself. The vulnerability is power. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and it's, it's something that's, it's hard for people to be vulnerable because you, you know, you, you're exposing well, you, kind of yeah, the stuff that's tender and it's, it's like, raw yeah, too, you yeah. know, when you've never really talked about it, even if it's a story from 30 years ago or 40 years ago, it's super raw. And w I was always fearful of bringing up some of those stories because what is it going to stir, right? Is there going to be a level of resentment and bitterness that comes out in me or is it going to Healing. be- healing and yeah. gratitude and I've I've been fortunate because it's been healing and yeah. gratitude and I if I can inspire one person if I can impact one person that's kind of the mindset every day you you talk and we'll finish with this you talk about uh your most important kind of work that you do especially early in a season is seeing the the girls and helping them you know, seeing their dreams and, and making those, you know, having those mean as much to you as they mean to you and helping them get clear on yeah. what they are. What are your dreams? Like when, when you look forward and you say, these are, this is what I'm like, so you know, in, what, in what my, fires you up? Yeah. You know? In my hand are the dreams of all of these women and they do really become mine. My personal dream for myself, when I when you ask me, what what do you want to do? Where do you see yourself? And what does that dream look like for you? I'm living my dream. And I didn't know if I would ever be able to say that, but I am living my dream. And I feel so fortunate that I have the right people around me that are helping me facilitate yeah. that dream. But I, I'm really living my dream. And that's not to say that I don't have these goals that I'm going to hold myself accountable to, um, which in 2024 is my year. Um, the things that I said I was going to do, I'm, I'm holding myself accountable to do it's that. It's time. It's time. One of them is writing a book. And yeah. uh, I, I, I've just, you just have to do it. Um, 
but yeah, I'm I'm living my dream. I have opportunities right now that I could have never imagined for myself. And it there's not I want more. I I don't have that feeling. What I have is more than enough. And I I love how you guys have this mentality of giving. I've always had a weird relationship with chasing money. I, I feel like as a as a daughter of immigrant parents, that's what the chase was growing up a lot. And so yeah. I, I need to rewire my thoughts about that. But um a little bit of over productivity anxiety too that is just in my DNA yeah. because of my upbringing. But I, I'm not chasing more when it comes to stuff and I'm my more has to come this way. And I, I just if, yeah, if I can do that, if I can find a way to continue to inspire people and motivate them and help them believe in themselves, then I'm I'm living the dream. So like I I teach with Corbin Church up at BYU. Yeah, I, teach I actually taught one of his classes. Is, I did a lecture there for him. Yeah. You, you go and I think, you know, we're talking about that same age group of 18 to 23. And I think if you went to any of those kids and you said, hey, you could be 40 years old or 50 years old and you'd be right in your sweet spot. You'd be living yeah. the life that God put you on this earth. Like any one of those kids would be like, how? You know, how? Yeah, and give so, me the- like when, when you're describing, I'm in it. I found the sweet spot yeah. and I'm in it and I'm just going to like. Ride it I'm, I'm going to ride this and I'm like, that doesn't happen very often. I think you, there's what, 8 billion people in the yeah. world. To get there is pretty special. Yeah, I, I've made it. It's, and when I, so when cool. I look at my life, I have made it. And that doesn't discount all of the other great things I still want to achieve. Of but it gives me this sense of peace and calmness to do those things. There's Yo. no rush. Yo. Um, I'm super blessed again, just with where my journey brought me. Yo, will you fire me up? Thank um, you. Grateful to have you come in here. If somebody wants to help BYU, I know this NIL world is like a wild Crazy, jungle. Crazy, yeah. yeah it's, it's the wild, wild, wild west. But, but if somebody like comes in, they say like, I am all about what Dilji is preaching and I want to help. How do they help? Like what? Like what's the way? What's the mechanism? Because I, I had this conversation with Coach Pope as well, and I don't think we're very. I don't think people know how to help. Like I, I think yeah, there's it, a lot of people that have means, that have resources, that would like to do whatever they can to help. So for me, it's it's more than obviously donating to BYU athletics. Somehow that gets somewhere in its help. But what for what I like to ask donors or friends of the program, and, and we have several that just have wanted to, yeah. you know, come forward and they want to help the women. Um, is it an experience that you want to help with? Is it an NIL deal with the women where they have to give something back? Um, what is it? What does it look like? And so I really leave it in the hands of, of the people that are, don't just write a check, right? What do you want to get out of this? What do you want to see? Because what I can promise is these women that are coming through the program are going to be empowered. Yeah. They're going to change the communities that they end up living in. They're going to take this inspiration that they are receiving and they're going to pay it forward. That's yeah. their role. That's their job. That's the only expectation I have is pay it forward. Um, so what what do people want to see? And and I I value people who want to invest in my women. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's more than just writing a check. It's actually identifying where you want to see that. And um, we've done some great things through um, friends of our program. We've benefited a lot. I've got this whole room that we built for the women to train in when the weather's cold and miserable as like it is right now. Um, we've went on some great trips. We've got a foreign trip that we're going to be able to go on because we had someone that, you know, donated money for that. And those are experiences that these women are never going to, never going to forget, you yeah. know, travel the world. That's just gives you perspective more than anything, be in touch with humanity, but kind of figuring out how do you want to help? What do you want that yeah. to look like? And there are many ways to facilitate that. For me, anybody that is investing in our program, 
when you see our women on ESPN at the NCAA championship, just knowing that you had a a part Yo. of that, a hand to help that. I think that that's because I know I be fall really into rewarding. that category. Like I, I buy into like what you're selling. Like, <laughs> I it, love it, like, it. Yeah. like if you're like saying we're doing this, it's like completely in line with my philosophy on life and people and love and, you know, and so I, I, you know, I'm raising my hand as one of those people that wants to be more involved and wants to help. But I think there's a lot of people like me and specifically that listen to this And I want those women to know who is helping, right? Because to turn around and teach them the idea of giving is is to connect them with the people that are helping them. I I think that's really important rather than just getting. It's here's someone that's giving this and and it will give them a lesson in what it means to, when you're in a position and uh, everyone's in a different position to give, whether it's giving is service or giving is financially, however it is, your time, um, we all need to get better at doing that. And so that's something that I can teach my women through donors of our program or friends of our program. I think that's a great lesson. Um, Just knowing though that you've invested in this program and uh, my goal is to always, you know, put badass women on the line. That's what I want to do year in, year out. And just to know and have the satisfaction of like, yeah, we contributed to that. I think that that would be really fulfilling. You're a gift to the world. You you truly are. Your life is a gift. And, And I think we're all lucky to know you and be around you. And when I think about like my daughters, like they don't run, you know, cross yeah. country and it's a high bar, but they'd be super lucky to have you as her coach. So anyway, thanks for coming in. Thank super, you. super, you know, fun conversation for me and, and we'll be cheering for you even more in, in the year to come. So thanks for ya. having me. Yeah. 